This is Allison here with the DevNet Sandbox team, and I'm here to give you guys an update on some of the stuff we've been up to over the past year. I'm a software engineer on the Sandbox team. I do a lot of backend and operations things, um, automation, Terraform, that kind of stuff. Um, I also, fun fact, I got my DevNet Associate uh, certification just before the deadline of this year. Um, so that's something that's fun this year. Um, I know it's been, it feels like it's been a really long year since last DevNet Create. Um, so we just wanted to kind of focus on some of the, the positive, exciting things. Um, so do some celebrations. Um, so today we're going to be doing some shout outs to different people, um, both to users as well as shout outs on the team. Um, and then we'll give you guys a little bit of an update on what you can expect to see from us from the next year. So let's start off with some good news and some, some celebrations and shout outs. First of all, we want to give you guys a huge thank you for everything you guys have done this year. So far this year, and these stats are a couple weeks old now, so the numbers are even higher in reality. Um, we've had almost 47,000 new users sign up. Um, we have a full catalog of 76 reservable sandboxes. And all told, cumulatively, you guys have made 86,785 reservations this year. The biggest stat, when I was pulling these stats together, what blew my mind the most was you guys have made a cumulative time of 162 years of sandbox time. That's over a century of tinkering, learning, coding inside of our platform. And we're super grateful that you guys chose to spend that whole century with us. Some more fun stats, um, shout out to CML for being your favorite sandbox. Um, far and away, CML and CML Enterprise are like over a third of the sandboxes, reservations that we see. Um, but the other sandboxes also have, we have pretty good spattering of reservations that happen. Um, I also want to give some shout outs to the sandbox team. Um, we've also been doing a lot, both behind the scenes and in projects that you guys will have seen. Um, so to get started, we've done we have in our 76 sandboxes that are public, we have 10 that are brand new. And I think that that might also be low. I think we've released a couple more in the last couple of weeks. Um, and 48 that have had upgrades over the last year, whether that's upgrading a major version or pushing out bug fixes. Um, that's a lot of stuff for, for a small team to do in a year. Um, so I just want to shout out to the team for all of that. Um, I also want to take time to just kind of shout out some of the cool projects that we've been up to. Um, I'm going first because I had to make one of these for, or else nobody else would do one. So this is a project that I had a lot of fun with this year. So this is my shout out for, for 2021. Here at Sandbox, we use Ansible to manage all of our internal DNS entries. This works out really well for us because it means all of our configurations are both versioned and stored in YAML files that are easy to write. However, we do run into issues sometimes because Ansible doesn't do anything to save state, which means it's really easy for you to overwrite somebody else's changes by accident. To solve this, I implemented a CICD pipeline this year for our DNS system. Basically, the way it works is anytime somebody pushes to the DNS repo, a pipeline is kicked off. Um, so it'll go through, it'll run a test, and then it'll deploy to the proper environment. This means that A, our code is actually getting tested and verified before we push it, which is always good with DNS because you can really break things if you mess up your DNS. Um, and it also means that it's much more accessible for anybody on the team, and it means that we're not overwriting each other's changes as much. Um, so this is something that's really smoothed out some of our workflows. Um, I did end up having to build a custom container for it because I was running into issues where the Ansible Docker image was getting updated faster than my code was. Um, so we have a, a custom image stored in our registry. Um, but this has really helped some, smooth out some of our operations while simultaneously making our process a little bit more robust. I also talked to Saad, who is on our team. Um, he is a cloud engineer. He does a lot of automation as well behind the scenes. Um, a lot of Terraform, PowerShell automation. And this is a project that he was pretty proud of this year. So Saad, tell me about this CML as code project you worked on. Sure, Alison. 
So in CML as a code, we actually have like different sandboxes using CML topologies and CML upgrades. So dealing with different, you know, network topologies uh, and dealing with like frequent upgrades. So I did that uh, automatically via sandbox as a code uh, where we can simulate CML and apply uh, network topologies with the upgrades uh, using different technologies like Ansible, Python, PowerShell, and just like uh, apply in one go on a fly. So that's the whole thing about it. That sounds really complicated. Did you have any issues with it? Oh yeah, we had so many issues before. Uh, like uh, the uh, basically the challenges we faced before are like frequent licensing upgrades and uh, network topology updates. And uh, there's so many security patches that needs to go with the previous versions and also like the version upgrades as well. So CML has like different versions every couple of months and they have different security patches in this one as well. Plus we have several sandboxes that utilizes different network topologies that we have to upgrade uh, several times uh, as per the user and uh, customer requirements. So uh so these are all the challenges we faced before so with that sandbox as a code we don't have to worry about it uh, doing all this stuff manually going into the v center and apply different upgrades in the sandboxes that takes a hell of a time so i think right now uh, we reduce so much time and um, via code uh, standards we can apply uh, all these changes like in one go and we don't have to worry about it. That sounds really awesome. Thanks so much for sharing this project with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I chatted with Eddie. Um, Eddie is one of our technical experts on the team. Um, he manages and works out of our EU data center um, and also does a lot of like operations, day-to-day -day things like, um, he's our vCenter guru, for instance. Um, and this was what he wanted to share. So Eddie, tell me about this new ACI sandbox that you worked on. Sure. So we built an ACI 5.2 Poly version uh, sandbox. The 5.2 is a long-term version for ACI. And in our initial sandbox, we deployed the ACI simulator, which runs the 5.2 version of AP. Uh, within the simulator itself, we selected a 5 and 2 leaf configuration and uh, where we also have the opportunity to deploy a two-spine four-node fabric as well. Um, and that's what we did. Nice. Um, so can you tell me about any challenges you guys had while you were doing this deployment? Sure. We had two main challenges. Uh, from a sandbox perspective, um, we needed to understand the changes within the API from a 4.x to a 5.x. Uh, this had uh, issues for us in regards to our provisioning stick that we use to deploy the ACI uh, sandbox uh, within sandbox. Um, we had to review the API uh, documentation. We had to uh, upgrade our scripts that or provisioning scripts that we use to um, provision the fabric, and that was one of the major learning curves or learning issues we had within sandbox. Cool. Um, so can you tell us why did you guys do this upgrade? What's so cool about the new ACI? So 5.2 has new hardware platform capability around the 93600. It has scale enhancements around where to MAC addressing on different places. Um, it has endpoint security enhancements. It has policy-based routing enhancements. And it has multi-cloud support, whether it is Azure, or GCP or AWS. And finally, around the API ecosystem itself, we have automation using Terraform and Ansible. Uh, we can also build, and we are building today, uh, learning labs around CTS, which is console Terraform Sync, using that automation to demonstrate an integration between CTS and an APIC uh, fabric. Nice, that's really awesome. Thanks so much for sharing this project with us today. Thank you. Bob was really excited to share with you guys a brand new sandbox that he was working on. He's a software engineer with our team who also does a lot of Python scripting and backend automation as well. We are all using Cisco WebEx for messaging, meetings, and phone calls with our coworkers. 
every day. But do you want to know more about WebEx from the admin perspective? And now, Cisco DevNet Sandbox team is pleased to launch our new WebEx C Pass Sandbox, which offering four features access against admin.webex.com. In there, you are the admin guy of a new queries organization. You need to manage users, teams, rooms, and call control settings from the admin perspective. Actually, it provides the same functionality as we sell WebEx to our customers. If you are a developer, you can try out all WebEx APIs, such as user admin, meetings, using the credentials we provided in the library email. Then you can send out gate, post, or delete methods to manage users in your own organization. Please scan the QR code below to book new WebEx box if you are interested. Justin is our resident IoT expert. Um, he works on a lot of our IoT sandboxes and it's pretty much his, his focus area. Um, so a lot of the new IoT sandboxes are things that he has worked pretty closely on. And this was a super cool project that he worked on this year um, that he's going to share today. So Justin, tell me a little bit about this IoT operations dashboard sandbox that you worked on. Sure. Um, this, this sandbox is designed to demonstrate the edge device management capabilities of the new newer IoT operations dashboard. It allows you to have access to real Cisco um, IR1101 hardware, and it allows you to add that and then um, be able to actually use some of the features along with it, which is managing and monitoring the devices and installing IOX applications on the device itself, and also secure equipment access so that you can manage your devices in the field. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. I know IoT sandboxes can be really complicated because you have like actual physical devices that you have to manage. Do you have any, did you have any problems with that? Were there any issues you ran into? Yeah, sure. Um, we actually had a problem uh, maintaining access to the device. Um, after devices onboarded to the operations dashboard, um, we actually had problems where uh, operations dashboard will encapsulate all the traffic uh, securely so that it can't be tampered with in an actual production environment. And that left us um, without the capability to um, run automated scripts. So what we did is I took a Raspberry Pi device and I put it connected it to the router. I did some some slight modifications and I was able to control and manipulate the power, the reset button, and the console um, as if someone were sitting directly in front of it, but you can do this from anywhere in the world because you can do this all with API calls. So for things like, you know, COVID or not having to have somebody always at the data center, um, you could just send the API commands during the automation process and everything's reset and you're good to go for the next reservation. That's so cool. Um, is there anything else that you want to tell us about the sandbox? What else can people do with it? So once you log in and reserve the sandbox, you can actually go in um, and beyond just onboarding the router, you can take advantage of the templates, you can take advantage of telemetry, cellular usage. The learning lab is great for giving you a step-by-step -step how to use the IOX application deployment and actually seeing and, and manipulating your little application. So if you have a web server, or Grafana or something like that, where you're you're trying to manipulate or see um, and make your data useful at the edge before it gets all the way back to the data center, you can do that. Um, and the secure equipment access is great because you don't have to necessarily worry about having an out of band channel. Um, that's you know where you have to build your own tunnels and things like that. So you can just go straight through the dashboard, get to the device, manage it, reboot it, do what you have to do, and you're good to go. And you can easily manage you know hundreds of devices with this, so you don't have to constantly keep a list of IPs or how the how we used to do it in the networking world. This is a really cool project. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to share it with us today. Absolutely. I also talked with Eugene. Um, he also works out of our EU data center. Um, he's focused a little bit more on monitoring and software stuff. Um, so NSO deployments, that kind of stuff. Um, and this was what he was brought to, to share today. So Eugene, tell me about the CML upgrade that you did this year. 
So we did a CML upgrade from version 2.0. So the primary reason for doing that was, uh, as you probably were, is new software enhancements, uh, vastly improved uh, user interface. And obviously what most network engineers like is upgraded uh, network devices and the latest version of code. That's really cool. With the software upgrades, did you guys have any challenges with it that you had to work through? Uh, one, one, one particular challenge is, is on version 2.0, we had an existing YAML file, which contains the, the network configuration. So the most important thing in that is to make sure that it's compatible with version 2.2 and the new code releases. And particularly what a lot of users were wanting to get fixed was the Nexus 9K integration. And uh, that took a little while, but we eventually got it sorted. Nice. I, I know CML is one of our more popular sandboxes. Um, what are some of the new things that come in version 2.2? Uh, one of the things is, as I mentioned before, is a greatly improved user uh, interface, much easier to uh, compose your own topologies. Uh, and the big thing about it is it's much easier to emulate your network without, without the need for hardware and also to build whatever platform you should, you should desire. We're using it right now, right? That's correct. Uh, we are using it for, uh, in fact, uh, design of our new data center that's actually based in our European theater. Uh, so the advantage of doing this here is we can actually simulate the design network uh, that we are going to install. Uh, we can validate all the network configuration and we can actually do live testing to make sure that it actually works in the way that that's actually expected. Also, what we can do is we can uh, change things like IP addressing uh, that can easily be done. And then we can actually drop this down actually to the actual hardware devices so that when we uh, arrive on site and actually fire up the existing hardware, we have exactly um, the uh, network configuration that we have in CML with no issues and they've all been debugged before we arrive on site. So it's a very cool product from that point. It saves an inordinate amount of time, very uh, little debug than traditionally would have been done in the past with just using hardware and terminal servers. Nice, that's really cool. Thanks so much for sharing that today. No problem, Alison, my pleasure. So that was a look at some of the awesome projects that we've worked on this year. Um, a lot of hard work, really weird year, not being able to like go into data centers a lot. Um, but the team really rose to the challenge and I just wanted to, to highlight some of the cool stuff we've worked on. Um, coming up next, I have Mike Mackay, who's going to talk about some of the future of Sandbox, as well as a little bit of a paradigm shift that we're seeing in Sandbox. Um, Mike is our boots on the ground in our US data center um, and also does a lot of operations, things like that. Mike, can you tell me about some of the plans that we have for the next year at Sandbox? Uh, yeah, sure. It's been, a, it's been a very busy year for us. Um, we shut down the Galway site, which was the beginning of DevNet. So if you look back in the history of DevNet, Galway was originally a validation testing site. And over time, that grew and became DevNet. And then after a period of time, we put a second data center into San Jose at a co-location there. And that was pretty much it for, for a few years. But uh, sadly, we had shut down the Galway site. It was a little bit of an end of an era for us, having been sort of the, the home of DevNet in the first place. But we shut that down in June 2021. The capacity for the building, et cetera, was just not up to uh, the requirements. And so we're now in the process of building out the Dublin site, which we hope to have live late 21, early 22 should be fully functional by the time we get to Cisco Live Amsterdam, and uh, it should give us backup for the San Jose site, as well as a local presence in Europe for uh, content and other delivery. Nice, that's gonna be a pretty exciting project, I think, when that's done. Over the past couple of months, we've been seeing a new type of sandbox start to emerge. Do you wanna elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, sure, so uh, traditionally, DevNet sandboxes tended to be sort of very vertically oriented within a certain product or product set. So Cat 9300s will be in a sandbox. We did have more complicated ones, things like uh, DNAC, for example. We would have the DNAC and the uh, ICE as well as the 9300s for um, the products. But it was still pretty much a single product set uh, and not a lot of cloud engagement. What we're really starting to see with Cisco moving more towards cloud services and software 
is this morphing of sandboxes into more complicated environments. Uh, an example would be our intersite Terraform sandbox, where although we have uh, products in the sandbox, the majority of the services that are delivered are actually delivered through the cloud. So we have Cisco's Intersight service, which manages our VMware and a product called IKS. And then we also have Terraform Cloud, which is able to initiate transactions on Intersight, and that directly impacts the services that we have running inside the actual physical sandbox. So it's a much more complicated sandbox, but I think longer term, they're, they're way more interesting, way more exciting than the older ones. And uh, it's definitely got some challenges moving forward, but you know, personally, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, there, there's a lot more functionality that we can incorporate once we start getting into some of these cloud products. Right. So yeah. I think we're going to see some really cool sandboxes in the next year. Thanks for coming on and talking about this with us. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Bye. So if you're watching this and you're like, yo, this looks really cool. How do I get started with this? Well, I have some really good news for you. DevNet Sandbox is publicly available and free for anybody to use. Um, all you have to do is go to https colon slash slash developer.cisco.com slash site slash sandbox and click that big white button that says get started with sandbox. You'll log in with your DevNet credentials and then boom, you have full access to our full catalog of 76 sandbox labs that have all kinds of fun technology, um, Cisco exclusive technology and also some open source technology as well. Um, as well as access to any new sandboxes as we push out new sandboxes. Um, so thanks for an awesome year, despite everything else. Um, it's been a really great year here at Sandbox, and we're really looking forward to what we've got coming up in the next year.